All right, it's time to buckle up and get into No Way Out. Uh, our guests today are Esteban Montero and Brandon Baylor. Uh, I'll let them introduce themselves here in a few moments, but I got to be transparent in a couple of things. Back in June 2022, uh, I was informed by Brandon that he's writing a book and it was about complexity theory and some other things and blah, blah, blah. Uh, I, I do follow a lot of complexity thinking, complex adaptive systems thinking. Uh, but to be honest, when you start talking about math, and mathematics, and these these things that we're going to talk about, I, I kind of closed my eyes a little bit and went, oh my gosh, here's something I don't want to get into. I was wrong. Um, and why I was wrong, I found out internally in my, in my home here, my wife, who does a lot of data curation uh, through Johns Hopkins University, is uh, grabbed the book and she marked the book up with a bunch of comments. And I'll just kind of share a few of those with you now. Um, here's a picture of the book and you can see her Whoa. work in it. Um, blown away. Oh my God. Yes. Uh, what a line, what a one liner, uh, a met, an amazing why in here and so forth. So what was she marking up? That's so important, um, to somebody in the data curation field in the field that's trying to move away from linked open data, uh, in a field that's trying to preserve not just data, but the context around it. Uh, and then to be honest, guys, when, when, uh, your book came out and I, I started reading it after she marked it all up. Uh, I really started to understand how closely related my work is to my wife's work. So uh, welcome, Brandon Baylor, Esteban Montero. Um, just real quick, uh, would you mind a quick introduction? We'll start with Esteban. Thank you, Bons, for the invitation. I'm very honored to be here. So I'm Esteban Montero. I, I was born in Chile and I started my career in the copper mining industry in Chile, in the Atacama Desert. Um, so that's where my my relationship to, to science and engineering and, and improvement and, and all of the relationship to, to the world um, came about because mining is a really interrelated field with, with like the natural environment in Chile and with the society and with the economics of Latin America. So that, that's where I got hooked in and, and then I quit my job, I decided to learn more, came to the U.S. to study, and that's where I met Brandon at Chevron. All right. Brandon. Yeah, no, thank you, Ponce, for this awesome opportunity. Um, really excited to be here talking with you guys this morning. So, uh, you know, similar to Esteban, my background is in engineering, so I've been working in the energy uh, field for, for my whole career, about 12 years now. And, um, you know, that's a I think we all can tell that the energy system is getting more complex, more diversified, more things that need to come together to to sort of lead us into the future. And so as an engineer dealing with that complexity throughout my, my whole career, trying to find ways to to go about it and integrate these different systems, integrate our perspectives so that we can have, you know, better outcomes in terms of safety and performance and and, and so on. And um, yeah, similar to Esteban, I had a, a fortunate opportunity to go and study and sort of get a formal training in sort of systems thinking, systems theory. And that's really what brought us together to try and tackle this together. Great. And we'll talk about how we connected here in a little bit uh, with Brandon and how I, how I met Esteban. Uh, but before we do that, uh, our podcast is named No Way Out. And I think you have a comment on that. Uh, you want to take that, uh, Brandon? Yeah, no, thanks. We, we love the name No Way Out. Uh, we actually, in the, the opening sort of chapter in our book, we talk about similarly um, this idea that there is no way out of complexity is how we phrase it. And uh, we do have a saying in the book and amongst ourselves that we say, just to put a spin on it, we say there is a way out and the way out is through. And yep. so, you know, let's discern what we mean there. So, you know, we agree complexity is inescapable. Uh, I think that's sort of a the thesis of the podcast. And we love that no matter where we turn, we're faced with this realization that there is no ground to stand on, right? When dealing with complex systems and, we think that we're, we're missing a way to sort of pierce through what we think is holding us back. And a lot of that, you know, the way out is through means how do we overcome the, the fear and the shame that stops us? What are the incentives and structural reasons for us to, to not have the courage to accept that there is no way out? And then from that sort of place where we can relax with the situation and, you know, from a place of humility and, and curiosity, start thinking about these ideas of how to bring math and science and, and art and all these things to to sort of open up possibilities for the future. So I just wanted to to put a nod to the the podcast title and give it our personal interpretation because we love that. 
That's great. I appreciate that. And Island's a disconnected effort. Uh, you re refer to that in the book. And I don't think you use the exact phrasing there, but the idea of destruction and creation, we have to go through these cycles. We have to shift these paradigms. And that's what we're going to really do today is kind of shatter that. Uh, and we're going to talk about category theory, uh, uh, perhaps. Uh, and, and category theory has popped up in, in my feeds and actually on the podcast uh, a couple of times from the folks that are looking at active inference, you know, how, how, uh, which leads to consciousness and perception and artificial intelligence. And uh, it has so many connections there. So uh, this podcast, um, we're, we're all practitioners. I'm not a, I'm not a practitioner of category three by any means, uh, but I'm a practitioner. We take a lot of lessons from complex adaptive systems theory, systems theory, and apply it to organizations to help them survive and thrive and overcome the VUCA in their world, or at least mitigate it and navigate it. Uh, but since we're practitioners, uh, I kind of want to get a sense of what, can, can you share with our audience why this topic, uh, which they may know nothing about, is so important to them, uh, and, and uh, maybe some examples of how you're using it right now? Sure. Maybe I, I can, can start. I can take yeah, go ahead. Oh, yes. Well, I mean, connecting it with the, with the way in how in how you answered the, the question of the way out, um, we we realized that in our path out, in our in our response to fear and shame, we have um, a lot of a lot of the reasons why you know we create problems. Actually, we create challenges and 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 disruptions for for systems and for society and for our industries. So it is in the practice of staying a little bit longer in the in the discomfort of, of what you, what you describe as, as Buka, as, as the complexity, as the inescapable challenge of like not really understanding what's going on. Uh, if you stay a little bit longer there and kind of embrace that feeling of discomfort, um, you can, you can not necessarily, uh, find immediately the, the answer, but you can avoid certainly running, running into, into more problems, creating more problems for yourself and for the, for the industry and for the companies and for the products that you, that you develop. So. I think that the, the book, in a, in a sense, is an invitation to, to hold it for a little bit longer, um, if that makes any sense. And in that, there is a lot of practice to be done. It, we are trained to, to, to kind of reject discomfort and to run into answers and to, and to have a very utilitarian way of, of thinking about problem solving. So, so that, that's what the, why the book is, is, is an invitation for us. It's a, it's, we call it a defense because it's, it's such a... It's such a problem. It's such a. It's, it's so persistent in our personal lives and in our professional lives. So, getting unco getting comfortable with being uncomfortable, staying in that uh, liminal space, if you will, is so critical in in dealing with the uh, challenges that are all around us. And, and I, I like the something you brought up. Self. Um, sometimes the challenges we make or the problems we make are self induced. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. as in fighter aviation, we had something known as pilot induced oscillation. You can create your own problems by uh, mm -hmm. compounding them by reacting to the environment uh, when you should just put your, we say, sit on your hands, just kind of relax and see what the environment gives you first. Um, so a, a, a lot of amazing connections there. All right. So the book, um, it's a, a categorical defense of our future. That's the name of the book. Uh, again, it was uh, published in the last, uh, what, when did it come out, by the way? Because the last note I had was from June twenty. Two October it, last year. October, yep. okay. Uh, so I was handed the book uh, not too long ago, and like I said, my, I gave it to my wife first to kind of uh, chew through it. Uh, but let's go through a little connection here on how uh, Brandon and I met and how I met Esteban. So through the Kineva Network, uh, Complex Adaptive Systems, I met Brandon through uh, Gary Wong, and Gary said, "Hey, you need to meet up, meet up with this person um, going through MIT at the moment." Uh, studying stamp and we'll talk about that here in a second and and studying with uh is it nancy levinson is that correct, mm -hmm. correct. so there's a safety aspect we're going to start off with and I, I think this is pretty unique because how does safety relate to data sciences which i believe we'll be talking about here shortly so so brandon uh and esteban when you're at, when you were at mit were you there to learn about category theory or more about safety or what's the relationship between safety and and, and uh, category theory yeah, I can I can yep. describe my journey there. Um, so yeah, the, the the program that I attended and for my master's degree was all about systems design and management, right? So that systems theoretic foundation, and I was really taken by 
the classes around system safety. And, you know, at first I was thinking, I have a decade of experience with a, with a, you know, a, a global organization dealing with safety with a great track record. And so what, what is there to learn? What, you know, sort of thing, but I, I sort of uh, practiced my beginner's mindset and uh, went in, went in and was really just taken aback by the paradigm shift around safety. Been thinking of it as not like a, a failure problem, but a problem of control. How do we deal with context? How do you keep humans in the loop? How do you, you know, control and put constraints on the components and the system to sort of make sure the emergent outcome that you want, like safety or security, is sort of achieved. And so that just really uh, took me down a path of of understanding that the the relationships between how components are interacting is more important than perhaps defining the objects themselves. And so that that's like a core premise of systems thinking, right? And and I think. It's almost cliche at this point, everything is connected. I think we all know that, especially in our community, talking about complexity. So it was good to get that theory around systems thinking as a concept. But what I found is that when you go and try to apply these, these modeling techniques, system modeling, model-based system engineering, you know, it, it's very hard to scale and actually implement any of the, the, the models and the technologies and how do you get them to interoperate? Right. So this is sort of the new phenomenon in, in our last 20 years with digital technology, Internet of Things, cyber physical systems. There's like this increased need for interoperability and to do it at scale. And because there's a proliferation of like data formats and, and structures and schemas and viewpoints, the current approach that we take to, to deal with that is sort of very based on standardization or, you know, a, a universal data model. And so we we found inspiration through a mathematician, a leading category theorist named David Spivak who put this analogy out there that really has marked our journey. He calls it the Copernican revolution. Like first we thought the earth was the center of the universe. Then we thought the sun was the center of the universe. Now we realize there's no need for a center, you know, whether that's a data model or like forcing us to have one perspective. It's, it's a constellation of data sets and schemas and, and interpretations that have to come together to, to create the whole. And that was a big shift for us and led us into this sort of world of, of mathematics that can represent those things. Okay. In your book, I want to touch back on safety uh, just to make a, uh, hopefully I make a, another connection here. Reason Swiss cheese. We use it quite a bit. Uh, we also use five whys quite a bit, and, and there's a lot of danger in using them in complex systems. Uh, if, for those of you who aren't familiar with Reason Swiss cheese model, it's, it's been around for years. We use it in fighter aviation. We use it in the military. It's, it's a way to kind of see, hey, when the holes of the Swiss cheese line up, you have an incident or an accident, or you can actually have something that's favorable if that happens to you. It's a good way to explain things. It, it's not universal, right? It just doesn't work everywhere. And, and that's not how the universe works. So being stuck with these models in our heads, they could be pseudoscience or they could have some type of context um, uh, dependent uh, use, which we, we, tend to find things in is, hey, this is contextual. It works here and maybe not over here. Um, I think the same thing is true with uh, with some of the data capabilities. And again, I'm not a data expert, just listening from my wife talking about the relationship between data. Um, sh she would say, hey, this has a relationship between this and that, and that's how you connect things. And that's what we do with, with uh, human systems sometimes as well. We'd say, hey, here's a relationship between X and Y, um, and there's a relation relationship model or relational model between two objects. Um, but my point behind this is we, we have to shift the way we think, um, uh, you know, go through that cycle of destruction and creation, destroy our old way of thinking to come up with something new. And it's not to say all those things that we had in the past are useless. They're still useful in context. Correct. So, um, uh, you know, where we're going with the new data structures and, and the, maybe the semantic web, I think it is, uh, th there's still value in having the old paradigms, you don't throw them out. They're useful in context, but they're not going to be, may not be as useful in the future. Just like reason Swiss cheese cannot be used everywhere. Right. So, so I don't know if that uh, resonated with the, the two of you. Can you expand on that or, or maybe dampen some of the comments I shared with you? We can add something. I, I think, so what you're, what you're describing when you talk about the old paradigms and the, and the mental model is, is kind of, um, it's kind of the story of what is happening in safety. We have a very solid decade long uh, history of, of success. I would call it in managing safety in many different industries in aviation, especially like in, you know, defense. I mean, these guys are amazing in how they, it's a miracle how they keep it together. And they have methods that are really um, the result of, of many, many years of experimentation and, and development. And so, and so it's really hard to criticize and to come and say, well, what else can we do? Or what can we do different? 
when we have methods that work. I mean, there are, in this moment, as we speak, so many airplanes in the air successfully flying, right? And so that's, a, I will say, the, the first challenge is like the walking the line between saying, how do you recognize what is good about these methods at the same time that embrace the gap and, and understand what, what has to be done to, to kind of address what, what is missing? And so I, I can point to a couple of things that are missing. One is when you ask the question, what can go wrong or what can happen that, that harms us or that makes, creates problem for us, the answer is infinite. So that's useless, right? And so how do we get to navigate a space of infinite possibilities in a way that is useful? We have limited resources and limited amount of time. How do we use those resources in a space that is infinite? So what we do in the current methods is to, is to use experience, is to use experts. And these experts, um, guided by facilitation tools, I would call them, um, you know, you, you, can, you can describe them as analytical methods, but they are really guides, pointers that they use. But it's really relying on these experts to use previous experience and to use uh, perspective that they have um, to come up with, with, um, with things that can go wrong. Now, in complex systems, in the systems that we are starting to see more and more right now, that is not enough because so many other things um, can, can, can occur. So what happens is that we start trying to use analytical methods. Now, this is, the, this is the challenge. No matter what you try to do, there are still infinite possibilities of things that can go wrong. So, so, so there is no way to overcome that problem. Like, again, there's no way out. There is no way out of the issue that there are infinite things that can happen to an airplane while it's in the air. And so um, how, do we, how do we navigate that infinite space again analytically? And I think that's where contributions like Nancy Lesson are so relevant because she creates a systematic way to go step by step. You don't, you don't need experience. Actually, experience can harm you in going through the process of, of STPA, of, of Nancy Lesson's view. You just have to follow the systematic approach that she came up with and, and, and you can come up with, with the answer to what can go wrong. Now, the issue is in, in her own words, STPA, it is, it's too good for its own good. And what she means by that is if you go to a manager of, of an airline and you say, look, these are the 900 things that can go wrong that you never thought about. And we, by the way, I actually have done that. I went to a, a shipping company once, did an STPA uh, on a process that was the most secure safety process in, in the company. For decades, they, they have not identified one new thing. And without any experience, just following the steps, um, we identify 800 new things. The manager didn't like it. You will think that like somebody, somebody in charge of that process will love that answer, right? Somebody will say, well, that is, that is great news. You found 800 things that are, that are going to be useful for me. Well, it's terrifying. It's a, that's again, that's a scary place. And so that's where kind of category theory, I think, can come in. It can help us navigate that space of, of kind of how you analyze systematically something, like using, using a more rigorous method. Um, but I have to say it still doesn't resolve the issue of you will come up with 900 things and then what do you do with that? And mm -hmm. so, so that, that's why I, I think it's, it's so hard to answer your question of how do we, how do we break the old paradigm? Well, the old, the old paradigm, um, is it, very successful. So we don't really have to break it. We have to add stuff on top of it and, and change by, by evolving into something something better, but, but preserving what is good about it, which is the heuristics of people, how people actually make use of experience and, and perspective in a way that is useful at the end of the day. Hey, Esteban, I want to uh, potentially touch on something you, you brought up here about the, uh, I'm, gonna call them, I'm gonna call them patterns right now, but the possible mm -hmm. ways things can go wrong. Uh, I'll do that first and then after that or before that, uh, could you, either of you comment on what is STPA and, and or STAMP? Um, uh, so I'm going to go ahead and try this real fast. When you go into an organization, people will say, hey, if there's four people or four nodes, um, how many links between them, right? And there's a simple formula out there that's, what is it, N times N minus one over two, right? And that gives you six. So four nodes gives you six links. And I believe, uh, I'll just look it over, the patterns in that um, within those four nodes is about 64, right? 
-hmm. that changes when you go up to 10 nodes. So 10 nodes, you get, mm -hmm. I believe, 45 different links, 45 different communication pathways. All right. But here's the shocker. Um, the number of patterns in that are 35 trillion, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so so uh, I think just to kind of frame, I think that might help frame people understand when we talk about how things can go wrong, when you start adding more components to something, um, it, it's not a it's not a linear thing, or I think that's what, yeah, it's not a linear thing. Cause that's a linear equation. I, I believe it's, it's, um, it's, it's worse than that. Uh, it, you know, 35 trillion is a lot of patterns, which is 10 people. Right. Uh, but that's not how everybody frames it right now. They frame it as look at those 45 links. Uh, does that resonate with you on, on what you're, you're uh, talking about when we have to think differently about these, uh, um, yeah, problems? absolutely. Okay. So absolutely. So what you are what you are describing is the the combinatorial aspect. Let's say like the amount of combinations or, or permutation yeah. of things that can, can that can that can create new types of or or possible scenarios. I would say that there is another factor, which is um, the fact that systems are really open and not closed. Yeah. So what I mean by that is that um, you can say that your system has six nodes or six components. And pretend that that's it, right? And say, mm -hmm. what can go wrong over my six components? But in reality, uh, the more systems become interconnected and complex, the more the boundary of what is defined as the system, the more, the more, the more your capability to say it's only these six. What defines my system is only the six things and nothing else uh, becomes obsolete because suddenly something else can come and interact with your system in a way that changes it. And so the, the openness of the system is another aspect. So even if, even if it was not true what you said, and there were only two nodes and the amount of combinations was very small, even if that was true, there are still infinite ways in how that those two nodes can interact with other things that you don't even know that they, that they can interact because okay. your system is truly open. Now, this is a debate on, on systems thinking and engineering on, on like, are systems open or, or can we do really define boundaries, right? What is an airplane? Is the, is the, that, mm -hmm. that, does the airplane include other things that are around it? And so that's a debate, but I think what we believe is, is that, um, uh, that is, a th th the definition of a boundary is, is an arbitrary thing and we can, yeah. and when, when we let it go, we see how it's infinite and complex in a way that, um, that, that can help us go into new directions of thinking. All right, and the shift from uh, behaviorism inside of safety and, and things like that, what we, you know, reason Swiss cheese and what we had in the military, human factors, accident classification system, I believe, uh, kind of re reductionist approaches. So I would put them more towards that end. So S STAMP and STPA, I believe I'm saying that correctly. Uh, can you just give us a quick overview on, on what that is so, so our listeners can understand what we were just talking about? Yeah, with, happy, with to, to happy to take that one. Right, okay. so so in the, in, the re in the Swiss cheese model, like, it's based on a on a framework that's called the the linear chain of events, basically. Like if you just keep the dominoes from tipping and creating this compounding effect, then you're good. So it really leads us to um, put in barriers in place and, and sort of redundancy and focus on failure as the main mode of sort of breaking the chain of, of events. It's a very linear and reductionist in that way. And so STAMP stands for System Theoretic Accident Model and Processes. So it's like a new systems theoretic framework to base our accident causality model on rather than being a linear chain of events. You know, it's looking at the dynamic context dependent interactions between system components that lead to safety as an emergent property, uh, as you guys were describing. And so whereas stamp is the foundation on how to sort of view systems as as controlled theory kind of uh you know, loops of feedback, like how we update our belief system, how we go about interacting in a dynamic way. STPA is the specific um, process analysis, system theoretic process analysis that guides you step by step, as Esteban was saying, through a scenario uh, in, a, in a control structure to understand at all levels, from management to down to the person turning the wrench, what are the interactions um, and controls in place to sort of create that dynamic uh, emergent behavior? Okay. And so um, I just wanted to... Sorry. Yeah, go ahead. No, no, no. To finish that. Just want yeah, to no, and I just wanted to kind of tie it back to to your your point, Esteban, and, and what Poncho was saying, like because he he was talking about the combinatorics, and that's the reason why we struggle. Um, and I just want to say to, to try to tie it back to category theory that 
you know, we ha we're dealing now with large scale networks of relationships because the, mo the model is relationships between entities and components. And these are people, these are software. Like it's, it's not a, you know, it's not predictable. Like you can't predict the behavior of how collective decision-making kind of comes about in that uncertain and ambiguous um, environment. And so even, even like graph theory, which is the branch of math that models the networks is unable to describe the richness and the meaning and the structures Right, mm -hmm. that are going on in those scale like scenarios, and so we need to like we we've been using category theory to extend graph theory to encode behavior in those networks and reason about the structures without getting distracted by the data or the details. You know, it's 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 allowing us to just reason very precisely about how things are related to one another, and that's sort of the premise. Wow, we could we could branch off in about twenty different directions on that right now. Uh, I'm going to try to keep us uh, on a, on an okay pathway that lines back to your book and and on the topic here. So leaders are are challenged by this uh, new way of thinking. You know, not necessarily systems thinking or complex adaptive systems thinking, but uh, this new way of thinking about uh, data integration or relationships within data. Uh, in your book, you bring up uh, six scams, and you also talk about seven features. Uh, you know, it, it, this podcast is predicated on the features of the world that we just can't avoid. We have to go around them or we have to work through them, just like you pointed out earlier. Um, so what's the limiting, what's preventing leaders and organizations from embracing this, you know, whether it be stamp or this new way of thinking about complex adaptive systems or even category theory, what's, what are those things that prevent them from really starting to embrace it? Maybe I can start that one. I, I mean, one of our, our feature, one of our things that we describe in the, in the book is definitely fear and shame. I think we are, um, if we look at our own careers, I mean, and I'm, I'm speaking for myself. Um, when I was, when I was little, the, the, the question of what am I going to become? What am I going to do? Is a, is a very pressing issue in society. Like, what am I going to do with my life? How am I going to be productive to this society? And, 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 and so we, we, we have that tension and that fear and we hold into something, a discipline. I'm going to become an expert engineer or an expert pilot or an expert. I'm going to be known for mathematics or computer science. It's, uh, these disciplines and these ideas of, of kind of, we call them buoys. Like it's like a thing that we hold in the middle of that kind of storm. And, and, and so. What is, what is a little bit tragic, Ponch, I think, is that society rewards us for, for that. And so a lot, of, a lot of our leaders and a lot of our executives, a lot of the people that are in power of decision making are people who have been successful building those, let's call them armors of societal clues that, that, that tells them that they are good for society. Like they became good mathematicians or they became good um, pilots and, and so on, right? And they became so good at it that that society rewarded them so so i think um after many many years of 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 um hiding the fact that we are really afraid that we we really that we are really scared of just being um of being rewarded as, as the most as the best as the fastest as the whatever uh we are we are asked by people to talk in an in an unconstrained way to say what about if there is no what about if we just look at this thing and we can think about it in, in an open-minded, beginner's mind way? And that is a really scared thought. It's a really primal, it's a really primal question that brings us back to, to high school, to what are you going to do with your life? You know, and, and nothing is not an answer. So you have, to, you have to have an answer. And so that, I think that's one. I, I don't know, Brandon, if you want to throw another one. <laughs> While you're thinking about that, I'm, I'm still yeah. trying to figure out what to do with my life. So, um, and I'm not in high school anymore. <laughs> well, and I just wanted Excited. to, uh, it, I mean, Ponch kind of hinted at it uh, and you, you, you articulated Esteban. It's, it's that pattern of destruction and creation of the self, really. I think what Esteban was saying ties back to, to that point you made, Ponch, of my, my experience with this journey was basically questioning uh, so many assumptions and, con you know, conditioning that I had been living through my entire career and in my personal life. And it just, um, you know, it's a tough personal journey to sort of say, maybe there's a different way. And I need to unwind all these sort of vexed preconceptions that I have about how the world works and how, how things are interacting. And so that takes a lot of personal discipline, I guess, to, to sort of take that journey. And, and it's an, 
it, it's not, I don't call it an evolution, like, which is always like a, an extension, a rolling outward of things. It's like an involution. It's like an inward journey of destruction, creation, like, com, you know, sort of ch challenging and reflecting, contemplating things. Um, because that's how we found that, um, you, you know, study the cell and you can sort of, or with others, too. So, yeah, that has something to do with it. Yeah. So one of the things uh, what you brought up shame and fear in the book and, and Esteban talked about it is ego. Ego's in there too. And one of the things, you know, the default mode of operation in an organization or the, the default mode network in our brain, um, we have to push that down, that ego, that, that, that self, so we can have access to higher entropic states where more novelty is and we can, re we can see more connections. And, and I'm going to look behind me real fast because I wrote something on the board. I want to make sure I get this right. <laughs> uh, we got to find those points of intersection, right? That, and you had that in your book. Um, that, that's what we're, we have to do. And that's that cycle of destruction and creation. So with that being said, uh, you have the seven features, you have the six scams. Let's dive a little more into why, uh, wh what are you doing with category theory and why is it important to leaders right now? Uh, we, we really haven't hit on this, so we kind of led up to it. Let's, let's go ahead and show everybody uh, what it is we're talking about. So why is this important and what is it? Yeah, so <laughs> I'm, I won't formally define it, um, but basically it's a, it's a branch of abstract math. Um, and the reason, you know, we found such a connection to category theory as a language to describe relationships is that it is kind of another better name for it perhaps is called relationship theory or structure theory. It's the study of relationships and transformations of networks and how things compose or sort of come together to understand the whole, right? Can I derive the meaning of the whole from the constituent parts? That's really what your theory is all about. And, and the mathematicians use it to transport ideas from different branches of math to help them solve theorems, basically. It's like a, it's like a meta language that lets you do math on math, which sounds mm -hmm. kind of weird, but that's, that's the idea is that it lets you translate between domains in a way that, you know, has a, has a common language, a common abstraction. You can wrap things in to, to get them to relate to one another. I mean, my brain just thinks systems, right? And like, when I mm -hmm. hear that um, idea of like, how do I, you know, the three of us have different mental models and schemas in this, in this conversation. I, you know, are we call, you know, how do we define, how do we, how do we figure out meaning amongst the three of us? Like I call an object blue, you call it pink, S1 calls it green. Mm -hmm. But what if we mean the same thing and the labels are what holding us back from actually having a productive conversation. And so category theory says, well, drop the labels. Who cares, you know, what the label is? Let's understand how the, my context and interpretation relates to your context interpretation. And let's think very rigorously about how to transport my schema into your scheme. And so that when I say blue, you hear pink. Like it's that, it's that, it's a language that's very precise and rigorous to let us uh, transport ideas and recontextualize things um, in a way that's sort of very precise. Okay. Um, so, so that's, yeah. Brandon, I want to, I want to, so, so my conversations with, uh, data scientists or my wife's is in data curation. This is what I understand and, and help me. And, and you know, we got to talk to folks that are listening to this podcast that are like, what are you, what are you talking about? So sure. linked open data, the relationship between, um, different disparate data sources, um, it, it's predicated on, on certain words and that, those relationships it, that requires humans to go in and, and put context or meaning to that data, even though they may or may not have um, an understanding of, of the context itself. Um, there's a danger with that. And there's a danger with uh, uh, just kind of uh, leaving the data the way it is kind of, you know, um, in, in an unstructured way. In complex adaptive systems theory, we rely heavily on interactions and, and that's the relationships that, that are more important than the quality of the agents. That's what we say, right? So when we build a high performing team, it's not about the quality of the individual agents. It's about the quality of the interactions. So we want to increase the quality of those interactions or, or those relationships. And that builds an emergent property of a higher performing team. Um, so I believe that's the same thing you're trying to, to do with data, right? It's, that's, that's the, the approach. Um, without using any math is we're, we're just saying, Hey, we want to work on those relationships and leave that context there with the, make sure it's context rich. And you also point out something that I think is critical. And this has to connect back to art. Art shows us the way because art has context. And you talk a lot about context. So, um, when we're coaching organizations, we talk about context as well. Context matters a lot and matters. It's, it's probably one of the most important things. 
because that will determine so much about what you do next. It's not the other way around. So uh, Esteban and Brandon, can you can you help me build on that and make that connection stronger to to category theory and, and what you're trying to do with the with data? Yeah, maybe maybe I can take that one. I, I think complementing what Brandon said, you I mean, Pond, you, you just hit something really important that is so subtle. And uh, we struggle, we struggle with Brandon saying this. So let's try let's try to uncover it for 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 people listening here. So we are trained to think in problems, in projects. Projects, think about the, 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 the definition of a project is something with a beginning and an end. A problem has a solution. And so uh, we are not trained to think about how problems relate to other problems. Like that, that's kind of a, a meta problem for us, right? I mean, it's like, a, so, so people in academia think about that. But in, in industry, we have a problem and we solve it. We have a project and we finish it. And so the... The, the the way in how we think about the relationship of problems with other problems and solutions with other solutions is you can call it systems thinking, but it's it's a it's a science that is kind of a little neglected. Uh, we found one good engineer one time in our journey who has tried very successfully category theory, and we asked him like why why are you not using it even more? And he said, well, there is no problem that I cannot solve without using category theory. So any problem I can solve it without category theory. So why do I need it? And, and so that's, that's why, why it trips us is the idea that like, and so I guess I want to answer your question kind of saying which role in society or in a company or in an organization or in a team is thinking about how to connect problems with each other. There is a, there is a team working in problems type A, like maintenance. There is another team working in problems type B uh, marketing. There's another team working. And so, but who is thinking in the, in how you connect them together? And so usually it's the management team. Um, but the management team doesn't do it from a very science-based perspective. It's very organic behavioral. It's, it's a, there's a lot of, you call it pseudoscience. Yeah. That's a good word. I think I agree with you. There's a lot of pseudoscience around how to do that. A lot of management school is based on a lot of pseudoscience. So category theory, I think is, is exciting because it brings science to that problem, real science, real math to that problem. Um, and, 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 and I think art and other fields do not think that way. They don't start by the premise of like, oh, I am, I am painting and painting and that's what I'm doing. No, it's just, I don't think mm -hmm. they, I think they break constraints and, and boundaries between disciplines from the get-go, from the beginning. Um, next week I'm presenting in in Spain, in a, in a conference called interdisciplinary school. Mm -hmm. And one of my points is why don't we call it non-disciplinary with that? We use that term in the book as well. The, the, the moment that you call it interdisciplinary, you start mm -hmm. with the assumption that you have to have a discipline to start to be part of that process. There you go. In order yeah. to be interdisciplinary, you have to have a discipline. If we think about it from a non-disciplinary point of view, then everyone is invited and every idea is invited and every framework is invited. and then. You know, it feels a little cha chaotic at the beginning, but that's when category theory can help us reason about that chaos and about that, that complexity in a way that, that I think is exciting because it hasn't been addressed until today. Okay. And, and that uh, conference, uh, when I took a look at it, uh, it looks like uh, a journey of what John Boyd went on was just looking at all these different disciplines, right? And then point, going back to your point there, but it's, it's, it's bringing them, you know, finding the connections, the overlap, the, the intersections, the, the relationships between them. And that's, you know, the, how, how basically he came up with the OODA loop. And, and that's the power of these things is you, he called it creating snowmobiles, right? You want to go out there and start connecting disparate ideas. And I think that's essential in what many organizations are trying to sort out when it comes to um, uh, big data. I'll call it big data for now. Mm -hmm. uh, so th this is uh, like, again, like I said earlier, there's so many directions we can go uh, on this. Uh, but back to the topic of, you know, complex adaptive systems interactions and going back to why leaders need to be paying attention to this, what is the desired outcome by using this type of thinking on, uh, and it could be data or whatever you want to pick on guys, but uh, maybe just data or information. What, yeah, what, no, what I you... wanted to, I wanted to address this directly because you, you asked about the data modeling and, and that aspect. And, and that's really the, the sort of the first 
true application of category theory and in in industry that, that we've seen is sort of like we call it categorical data migration or categorical data integration. And you, you said it very well, Ponch, that the challenge is that if I need to think about a complex problem as a, a decision maker or a leader, I have to kind of pull data models and different representations from a disparate set of, you know, teams and, and, and sort of data models, right? And, you know, today we have humans sort of dealing with these systems of tables that are like objects that we have to reason about, data sets. And a human has to sort of chase the, 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 link, the transformations of how data gets from table A to table B to table C, right? So like a human has to carry the context and the meaning of like when I trace all these different connections in, a, in an information system, and that's error prone, right? It's time consuming. It's, it's like no human has the capacity to deal with that, right? Their intuition can't, can't handle it because if you've ever done any data modeling, it's like a, a spaghetti diagram of just relationships and joins and all these complex database stuff. And so what category theory does is says, okay, you know, if, if I know that table A is connected to table B and I know that table B is connected to table C, because I'm using a, a sort of a mathematical formal system, I can deduce through inference that table A is connected to table C. And that leap is called composition. It's the composition of these two tiny arrows to get the big one. And now I don't have to carry that knowledge around in my head anymore as a data modeler. I can let the system keep track and make sense of this relationship that I just established between these three tables. And just imagine, as we said, combinatorically, if I can make those inferences to these sort of indirect things that aren't directly connected, but I know that there's an indirect connection through composition, you know, and I, and the math sort of gives you uh, abilities to detect like, oh, you create a contradiction. This path doesn't equate to this path anymore. And it'll give you feedback to say, hey, there's an inconsistency here. Whereas today a human has to carry all that extra baggage around mentally. And it's, it's, it's almost impossible to keep track of. So it helps us improve the data integrity constraints that need to fly around to deal with all this heterogeneity. And to your point, that leads to higher quality decision-making because now I can trust that I'm not creating a contradiction when I put these two things together. Okay. Uh, machine learning and AI, uh, you mentioned something in your book about explainable AI uh, that it may not exist, right? Uh, could I get your take on that, guys? Just just what uh, what your view is on on explainable AI using category theory? Well, let me build on my last point because it's very related, right? Like data is, okay. is you know the the raw ingredient that we think of to sort of do a lot of these machine learning um, problems, right? In the data science activities, if I can just train this this big data set on things we already know how to do, then I can sort of get a statistical uh, prediction. And so mm -hmm. the difference between that sort of paradigm of machine learning, which is statistics based and, and actually never gets us to the 100% certainty, because mm -hmm. that's the how, nature of how it works. What we've seen in, in sort of category theoretic approaches to, to sort of machine learning is that it's not reasoning about a, a big set of data. It's reasoning about the structure of how things are related. Like again, like forget the data for a second and just look at how these data columns are related. And I can encode constraints at that level because now I've I'm at this higher level of abstraction. I don't, you know, and, and that can give me a more certain um, sort of uh, symbolic way to reason about how things are connected um, versus a statistical uh, likelihood of, you know, a prediction. And so that's, a, that's the difference between like a safety and safety situations. I need to meet all the requirements hundred percent of the time. I need to try, you know, I want to, you know, under, when I put my hand in the, the confined space and rotating equipment, I want to know for, for sure that, something isn't going to happen. And so I, I worry that, you know, we use machine learning based on statistical, you know, it's never going to be hundred percent and sort of that 1% isn't enough. We need new ways to, to sort of ensure integrity of systems as they come together. And that's where category theory shines. Okay. Uh, how about this? Um, is there a connection to like uh, self-driving cars and the use of category theory? Uh, is there a way to make a connection there? Well, um, I will say that the, the, the challenge, so, so the, the paradigm between, between the paradigm shift, I will say between category theory and, and the machine learning behind kind of self-driving cars, I will say is the idea that with enough connections, um, you can achieve the, the intelligence that you, uh, that you require to drive a car. And basically that's, that's uh, an explicit statement of many of the leaders of, of car companies that are trying to mm -hmm. pursue 
autonomous driving. It's like we we just have to push this through until we get enough people trying it, and and at that point it will, it will be smart enough and it will it will connect. Um, and on the other hand, so that that's what I will uh, I mean I will describe as 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 what in cognitive science is called connectivism or, or basal cognition. The idea mm-hmm. that like you can have from the bottom up um, these different entities connecting to each other and and and, uh, and achieve cognition at some point. This is kind of a predominant theory right now in in cognitive science, and and that's what it's really really popular way right now thinking about that. On the other on the other side. There is this systematic way of thinking, which is kind of attached to category theory. Um, and I think, um, and this is, this is just my opinion, but I, I think it's a mistake to think that you will describe exactly how a car should drive with no mistake. There is no way because there, again, there are infinite possibilities. Mm-hmm. And so you can describe in a categorical way exactly how it will work. And so, and so that that interpretation of of category theory used to drive cars, I would say, is a is a misleading one. I, in that sense, there is more hope in a basal combination of cars driving than in the other one. Now the problem remains that Brandon is pointing out, which is, how do you address that one percent in where the car thinks that it should stop, and it's not stopping because you know it misinterprets something probabilistically, right? So. I think the answer is a different answer, and I think category theory has a has a value in that. I think there is a cognition that is more embodied, multisensorial. Mm-hmm. I think humans are better than machines, not because we have more or less connections, but be, but because we have different types of connections working all together at the same time. And so, if you think about it in a in a multisensorial way, if you think about it in a way that is more embodied with the context and with the different aspects of what is going on at every part of the driving um, dynamics, there is an aspect of composition, if you think. There is, a, there is the perspective of my, my smell senses, and there is a perspective of my vision, and there is a perspective of the noises I am hearing, and there is a perspective of the geographical places in where I am, and there is a perspective of the time of the day. All of those yep. things play together. Now, how do you, the problem, the problem that we have, I would say in a technology point of view is how do you bring those perspectives together and compose them? And that's where I personally believe the power of category theory as a translation tool, as a composition tool of multisensorial things is addressed. Now, just back directly to the point that Brandon was pointing out in a deterministic world, we have to decide, do we stop or not? Do we hire you or not? Do we, mm-hmm. do we, do we buy or sell? Those are deterministic answers. So I do not think that category theory or any mathematical tool will ever be able to describe the full systematic way of arriving to this answer. I don't believe that. I, I think there are infinite ways to, to achieve that. So maybe for a specific case once, but it's useless the next time. But I do think that if we bring multiple perspectives and compose them together using a tool of translation, then we will have... Um, a complementary way of thinking about basal cognition in a way. Basal cognition requires composition because mm-hmm. these different elements have to come together. And in order to come together, they have to talk each other's languages, metaphorical languages. Yeah. Um, so I don't know if that resonates no, that's, in a way. It's extremely but... helpful. Uh, it's, it's triggering a couple ideas here. Uh, number one, uh, humans, I don't think, could have a true understanding of the reality, right? So, so mm-hmm. why should machines? Uh, and then two, uh, a recent connection. I think Brandon and I talked about this. Actually, we talked about it a few months ago. A- active inference uh, is popping up mm-hmm. in a relationship between category theory. Uh, any comments or thoughts on on uh, how they work and and what what are, what are you guys looking at when you start looking at active inference and uh, your your work with well, category theory? Yeah, I think just to to put it keep it pretty high level. I think when I think about the active inference model of like perception and sort of action, what I see category theory useful for is, um, you know, the mathematicians often refer to it as like an accounting system. It lets you keep track of meaning and sense making that's happening at multiple, you know, systems are multi-scale, they're diverse. They, like Esteban said, said just now, like multiple perspectives with their own language, their own vocabulary have to sort of come together to form that, that perception, right? And so that you can then act on it. And that's why we, we see it as sort of a language to represent 
those different things and, and help them come together in a way that preserves the consistency and the of meaning uh, as as they all need accounted for basically right we don't have a tracking system to sort of deal with all that meaning in a way that uh, can lead us to more collective better collective decisions and so that's where I see um, having a language to sort of force clarity right it's like we, we say clarity over simplicity <laughs> because right. yeah. uh, a lot of times our response to dealing with a complex environment is like let's simplify and that's obviously not going to cut it and so what we say is what category theory it kind of forces you to slow down and formalize what you're doing like like take the time to to get cl like clarity and in that yeah you're spending extra time again another challenge for why business leaders may not like this right away like you mm -hmm. invest up front in in clarifying your thinking your reasoning but the the payout is like it doesn't become this like n squared problem combinatorically it's like it sort of scales better because yeah. you it's like yeah so that's sort of where i think category theory may play a role as a modeling as a as a language as a way to represent the multiple pieces that must come together for for that perception to happen nice uh we're going to wrap this up here in a few minutes uh but before we do, uh, we're going to continue the conversation after we do a quick wrap up here. And we'll, we'll go into the YouTube's uh, work here in a moment. Uh, before we do that, I believe you guys started something new, right? Uh, in the last couple of weeks, um, in, in addition to the, the conferences you're being pulled into, uh, can you tell us a little bit about what uh, uh, both of you created? What's it? Is it whole on whole on labs? Am I getting that right? And why did you pick the word whole on if I'm saying that correctly? Well, I can I can answer that. We we started a research foundation, Holon Labs, and our objective is to achieve what we call uh, collective computers, collective computation. And so we we think that um, all of these questions that you are asking, all of these um, issues about how we think and how we deal with decision makings, are about the collective. Uh, eventually, this we are not single agents making decisions. We are families. We are teams. We are corporations, we are societies, we are countries, we are collectives of people. And, and, and the way in how we come together and how technology can, can, can help to, to facilitate that, we believe is one of the key questions in, in the future of, 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 our, of our species and our, our societies. So, so we are very excited to put our, our time and, and passion to, 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 to develop this, this new technology, our collective computer. Uh, Brandon, if you want to add anything, yeah, I just I think also we're we're motivated by, you know, the the way we relate to technology and computers today. Like they're really good at repetitive tasks and things that have some degree of certainty. And so we think that there's a space for for something new, and understanding how that collective, you know, intelligence emerges from interacting non-intelligent resources. But we actually push it in a different way, and I want to want to embrace awareness, like collective awareness, and so. Maybe that's the way to lead us forward, isn't through smarter, or more intelligent, more, you know, maybe it's more awareness, more compassion, like take maybe taking the time to just pause and contemplate will help us, as you said, do, through the, the pain of the destructive part of our journeys mm -hmm. that we have to take to, to be able to learn new things, be open minded, reinvent ourselves. And so we think there's something to say about um, technology's role there. And we want to uh, put forward our best foot on, on research and development in that space. Okay. Hey, uh, before we go to uh, No Way Out Extra Time here, is any anything you want to share with our listeners about, one, how to connect with you or anything else you want to touch on before we shift over to the extra time? We have a website, categoricalfuture.com, um, and our book is, is on Amazon. So, I, I mean, the contact information is there. Um, the best way to give us feedback is through the reviews and to just give us feedback and interact and engage. This is a we want to connect with others. This we we appreciate the time with you, Ponch, because this is exactly why we why we are doing all of this. We we believe these conversations are so necessary. So you can also follow us on LinkedIn, and you can follow the the Whole On Labs page, and that's where we post updates and thoughts around our vision, what we're working on, etc. So that's a good avenue. That's fantastic. All right. Well, we'll uh, invite our guests to shift over to uh, the YouTube channel for now. Uh, and for those that uh, are, are going to go ahead and uh, disconnect here, we, we appreciate your listening to us and pick up the book uh, here. It's called A Categorical Defense of Our Future, Esteban Montero, Brandon Baylor. Uh, my quick review of it real fast is uh, uh, a lot of overlap with what we've been talking about for years. Uh, you know, Alice's checkerboard to a Swiss cheese model to 
uh, new ways of thinking about safety, complex adaptive systems theory, uh, the, the overlap with, um, you know, actually how we're training folks uh, within some of the organizations you may be familiar with. It's, it's an exceptional book. It's a smooth read. And like I said, my wife, when she, uh, when I handed it to her, cause I was, I was kind of scratching my head. Am I going to read a book about math? No, it's not about math. It's about uh, a lot of things we covered here today. And and her view from her perspective is this is a game changer in the field of data science, data curation, uh, and what the, they're trying to do to preserve context when we start looking at, uh, you know, future things. So uh, thanks everyone. For, uh, thanks Esteban. Thanks Brandon. And uh, we'll see you next time on No Way Out. Thank you. All right. Hey guys, that was awesome. Um, it's like I said, there's so many things to cover in this. It's, it, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm writing notes everywhere as, as we go. And there's so many different <laughs> pathways to go on uh, a couple of weeks ago. I, I was kicking around an idea with Brandon on, can you preserve data inside of, um, uh, uh, DNA or, or, uh, what's uh, Brandon, what's, what do you call that underneath Your, the, the trees? Molecular computing or oh, yeah, fungi, yeah. yeah, fun, fungal computing. Yeah. Yeah, fungal computing. It, it, you're looking at that too, right? I mean, is this mm -hmm. is it possible? Mm -hmm. It is. You mean to pres to preserve data? You mean to to do these things of memory? That's what you mean. Maybe. I, so, yeah. if I understand it, the best way to preserve data for future generations could be in DNA. It could be in a biological system. Ah, I see. Is that, yeah, is that true? I mean, well, or, I can I, I can tell you a a quote from uh, Babbage, Charles Babbage, uh, who is created to develop the first computer, you know, English scientists and computer scientists, I guess. Um, and he, he used to say that the air has memory and, and, and so everything preserves data, I think. And, and in, in a sense, the question is not, can it preserve data? The question is, how do we, how do we access it? How do we, how can we interact with the substrates in a way that, um, that unlocks the, the knowledge that they already contain in their, in their DNA? or in their internal structures that they have developed over many, many, many years of, of evolution. So, yeah. Well, and we're, we are working directly with uh, one of the leading unconventional computing experts in the world, Andy Adamansky. We just announced on, on the LinkedIn that he joined as an advisor to our Holon Labs. And he's leading the world in sort of prototypes of, you know, computing with, with fungi and mushrooms, right? Like you, mm -hmm. you stimulate one of the mushrooms and like it just pro like any computer, it's sort of like processing information. They can, they can uh, encode logic gates and things like that. So that's the work that he's doing and, and inspires us in a lot of ways to, to sort of not just be inspired by nature or like biomimicry, but actually using nature to compute and to perform complex operations like that. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, the network that's underneath the, uh us between the trees and, and, the, and the fungi. Um, there's a name for it. I can't remember it, but that it's, it's that low, what's it called? Yeah. It's like the mycology network. Like, yeah. The, yeah. Yeah. So, so what we, what I understand is some, like you pointed out, you, a tree can have a relationship with another tree and, and sense what's going on over there. Right. That's kind of cool. And there's also an idea that, um, you know, our interoceptive capabilities that we don't truly understand that we're connected in ways uh, where, where we're sharing information through another sensory organ or sensory capability on our body mm -hmm. or, or multiple of them. So I imagine there's, there's so much more we're going to learn over the next 10 years than we have in the last 100. I keep hearing people say that, that uh, the next 10 years will replicate in not necessarily the quality, but the quantity of lessons we learn uh, or we learned over the last 100. Um, and I think category theory has, has uh, something to do with that. Uh, guys, man, I, I, there's, again, there's so much to, to, to talk about on this. Uh, what, what do we miss uh, during the, uh, the live session, the 55 minutes we went through? Um, anything else you want to cover here? I, no, I, had, I mean, you hit on my notes. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I love <laughs> talking more about the, the nature, the regenerative aspects, like how it, the computing stuff could be another conversation all of it to itself, but we appreciate you, you know, laying out the outline of the book and, and bringing category theory to light. I think that's a, that's a huge opportunity. So having the stage to describe category theory through our lens, um, because it's a void, there's nothing between um, sort of today's and, and like the literature, right? And that our book is really trying to be a, a contribution yeah. to a tiny stepping stone for people to sort of point way over there and get your, telescope and say, Hey, there's a, there's a community here that's sort of inventing a, a something really cool. So 
thank you for giving us the opportunity to check that out. Yeah. And, and Brandon, when you shared that uh, YouTube video from the Active Inference Institute on um, category theory, you know, I watched it and, and it's heavy math for me. I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, there's a lot in there. Uh, and not long ago, and, and it'll be released on this podcast, the um, Daniel Fre uh, Friedman from, hopefully I got the right name, Daniel from the Constructal, um, not Constructal, um, Active Inference Institute, hopefully I said that mm -hmm. right earlier, uh, had a lot to talk about with uh, uh, category theory. So there's there's an interesting connection there. And for us uh, with the OODA loop, we look at the OODA loop, the four pathways that many people forget about inside the OODA loop. Uh, that would be active inference. Uh, those that, so we kind of say that it already exists in there. Uh, and mm -hmm. therefore we have a nice unifying sketch, if you will, of how to understand um, reality, right? And and just recently, Elon Musk started, what is it, XAI with that mission to understand mm -hmm. reality. So uh, is there a connection with category theory and understanding reality as well? Well, I, I would say that the, the relationship to, to hold on a bit is the idea that um, we believe, and, and please please give me feedback on this, but we believe that we don't really need to understand reality. Mm, okay. Like understanding reality is, is, a, is, is a paradigm that, that, that is kind of very fundamental to science. This idea that, that like truth, and I, I was reading a poem from Dante actually yesterday, and he said, you know, humans in the pursuit of truth, they set, they fool themselves with doubts and questions. And these questions start to grow, he said, from the ground, like, like wheat. And then he said, well, you know, at some point the wheat is so high that you cannot see the floor, which is actually the truth. Hmm. And so, um, I think that there is a shift coming uh, point. I, and this is I know, again, another opinion and why we believe, um, Holland was necessary. I think there is a there is a there is a shift on paradigm on science, which is un driven towards understanding, and and more shifting towards science that is more driven towards experiential transformation, changes that are happening through our experience with life. Um, and I think I mean it's, it's interesting that you mention Elon Musk because without saying his name, he's he's the one who is thinking that cars can be autonomous if we just put enough of them. You know, mm -hmm. and um, so that's basically what I was referring to connectivism. Okay. We, we believe I, that there is something experiential about technology that is missing in the picture. I just um, wanted I to get up something. Uh, oh. I, yeah, I goofed up something. It's not the nature of reality. It's actually the uh, understand the true nature of the universe. So uh, right. I apologize if I, I got that wrong there. Brandon? Yeah, I just wanted to, you mentioned the OODA loop and like there's these feedback connections, right, to each mm -hmm. of the four. Um, and what I think of maybe category theory's role, it's, it's in the same way that like when humans invented writing, it allowed us to like capture and study individual thoughts in a new representation. And I think we're on the cusp of like, imagine those wire, those feedback loops in the OODA loop. Imagine mm -hmm. you could like open the hood and each wire and like think about, think about the wire, right? Like it's almost like this engaging in a Kahneman system two type of like self-awareness. Like it gives you a, a way to, sort of think about thinking, like about at a meta level, what's going on with those wires. Mm -hmm. And so think of it the same way. There, there's, there's, there's representations, there's things that are just not accessible to our perceptual abilities yet. And we need a technology that lets us think about thinking, but for like those, those sort yeah. of networks and structures and collectives. And so it's just something to, to add on. Hmm. All right. Uh, yeah, guys, uh, just so much going on. So we, like I said, we've been talking to the Active Inference Institute, uh, you know, a few more cognitive uh, scientists on mm -hmm. here, neuroscientists, uh, we've got some neurotech things coming on. Uh, so you can kind of see how we're weaving this together. And e even though we're not trying to connect it to the John Boyd Zuda loop and say, this is where it fits in here. That's, that's not the point of this. It's to really have the conversation about shifting paradigms, reorienting, uh, remember, because that's what we're trying to do is go through that cycle of destruction and creation. And I think this fits uh, fits nicely in there. I am thankful there are people like you that uh, do this work. Um, you know, I'm I'm a I'm a generalist. I'm, I can talk about it for a minute and go. I, I think that's all I know. Uh, but there's a lot. Of, is there is there a lot more math in this than there is an active inference, or is it, is it less? I I, I kind of heard. Um, and maybe a little bit less. More math in in what on our side? Like 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 you know, there's the the math behind uh, defining active inference. 
uh, in your book, you don't have a lot of math in there. It's just, you have a lot of, um, uh, right. diagrams, relationship analogies diagrams, and stories. Like analogies. Yeah. 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 So is that, is that true as uh, ca category theory is more about the, the narrative, the analogies, uh, than no, it it's about a the hardcore, math? it's a, it's like algebra you learned in high school, but, but okay. instead of numbers, it's, it's mm -hmm. gone to relationships and functions and okay. networks of things. It's, it's built on the same de decades and centuries of good math work, mathematical work. It's very rigorous. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And like I said, I'm, I'm thankful it's, it's for me, I'm thankful it's not in the book. Cause I'm like, anytime I read about active <laughs> inference and see all the math behind it, I, I skip those 20 pages and go to, just tell me what I need to know. <laughs> right. Well, that's, what's missing is that sort of, you know, accessible motivation, you know, view of how this math could work for us. Cause it's a lot, we're still a long way to go, but someone yeah. needed to sort of point to, we, we're not mathematicians either, although we're, we're, we're mm -hmm. getting there to, to be able to apply it in our industrial setting. But um, yeah, someone had to tell that story and that's really where our book contributes, we yeah. think to the, to the field. And is there a language, uh, a, a software language that, that has, this type of math in it already, yeah, or is great it going to be developed? That's, hmm? It's being developed. We're we're very in, involved in that effort. There's not many, but hmm. there is an open source um, community that's developing a categorical libraries uh, called CatLab. So it allows you to implement these sort of constructs from category theory on real systems and model. There's also a tool called Simogram that our friends at the Topos Institute are working on. They're sort of the leading okay. mathematicians in the world. There's also an open source tool called CQL, which is like, maybe your wife is interested in this, a categorical query language that lets okay. you enforce those data integrity constraints as if you were using SQL. She might be familiar with that, mm -hmm. but it, um, it's much more um, rigorous and has some algorithms that um, you would love. I would love to show you the demo sometime of how we would apply it. It, it detects contradictions like in real time that prevent you from you know, sort of making yeah, mistakes. Yeah, I'll, so. I'll, I'll, I'll put you in touch with her because she, that's her space. Um, a couple other strange questions. Uh, semantic web, I think you put that in your, um, in your book. And then I, I, I sent you a note on spatial web. Is there a relationship there? Did, did you look into that at all by any chance? I mean, I've, I've been, and I'm sorry, I'm sort of dominating this for a minute, Esteban. I just, um, I mean, I, I hear semantic web a lot. I, I guess I, mm -hmm. I hear a lot of similarities to what we're saying, but I guess the point to me is that the fact that they use the word semantic tells me that they see meaning as important in the next iteration of how we communicate and interact across the web. Today, there is no mm -hmm. meaning as you know we use our personal computers, hence why we're interested in a collective computer that lets us carry meaning, right? R rather than the, the information theory we have today, which sort of, you know, Esteban loves to cite Claude Shannon, who invented sort yeah. of information theory. You know, semantics is not relevant to, to the engineering problem. That's a quote from his thesis. And so I think this, the, to me, when I hear semantic web, I see people recognizing semantics are important. Meaning is important. We have to figure out how to translate across the network better those things. In, in, the, in your book, you do talk about uh, Shannon uh, information. Um, it's called Shannon. So you also get ent entropy in there a little bit. Uh, you can touch on that. So Esteban, um, uh, I want to connect. I want to ask a question to you. Uh, how mm -hmm. does entropy play into uh, category theory and inform uh, either information theory or um, the Claude Shannon entropy play into categ category theory, if at all? Yeah, well, I think I think how entropy, I mean, and we, we ask all the time this question, and I think the, the, the inspiration in the book is, is the question of how entropy plays in life. What is the relationship between entropy and and the whole dynamics of living systems? I think people have tried to to answer that question. I think there are um, there are scientists like Madurana that we said that we that we quote on the on the book as well, who 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 said that kind of that is the living character that is the characteristic that kind of define living systems, which is this this self uh, management of entropy. Kind of not not on non other system that is not alive has this thing that that kind of manages entropy mm -hmm. through through increasing complexity um in fact so that's that's a very profound relationship i mean think about it living systems um increase complexity and with that they affect their levels of entropy and um and so in our information systems, in our technology systems, in our systems developed by people like Shannon and, and many other engineers, 
we try to do the opposite. We try to, we try to kind of reduce the, the complexity mm -hmm. and in, in the sake of kind of stabilizing the, the, the relationship to entropy. So I, I think it's a, it's a profound question. Thank you for raising it up. And I think that's why we are so interested in living systems. That that magic that they have, that characteristic that is so unique, um, and I will say it's a mystery still for science. How do how do they how do they get to do that? You know, what is the and again back to the relationship this this relationship between the cell and the mitochondria that they are kind of fighting this eternal the, the eternal balance between be, becoming a parasite and codependency, but also to become partners mm -hmm. and. Um, and in that fight for 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 becoming kind of um, one for for sharing that space in the cell and the mitochondria, there is this there is this consumption of energy that drives mm -hmm. this that drives life in a way. So it's it's so profound. And I think for an engineer who was trained in a very um, in a in a way that is very much about machines, about you know about um, inputs and outputs, and about you know, not, not, not in this way, the concept of entropy becomes so fundamental, um, to how we relate to how we, to how we integrate and, and to how we think about the, even the purpose of a system, uh, there, there is, there is, uh, I don't know if, if you have seen it, but recently in the, in, in biology, this idea of, it's very controversial, this idea of endo, endosymbiotic theory is called this idea that like, you know, the, this fight that the cell has with the, with the mitochondria and the, is, is kind of the source of life is, yeah. is we used to think that, that life was kind of this evolutionary process in where individual agents were fighting with other individuals for survival. That was kind of the predominant theory. And now we have this theory about like internally, this process of balance, um, pr relating to this entropy. So that. I think Shannon, to answer your question directly, completely missed that, hmm. you know, uh, completely. Is, and, and I think it was amazing because it allows us to simplify the, the story and, and, and achieve this computer communication that we are having today. But I think it's reaching its limits. And I think we need to revisit it with a more like holistic point of view. Well, and that's so, where uh, just briefly, if I may, Ponch, do you mind? Just yeah. to, just to show, like to, to, conclude with like, how does category theory play a role there? Like we're, we're humans, mm -hmm. we're systems of systems all the way down to cells interacting and like, right. right? Like, and the, each of these systems compose to form a whole. And then those holes can form the, that's the whole on thing, right? That's why we chose the name actually. And because category theory is a science and math of studying things that compose, it lets mm -hmm. us think about that sort of process of like how life emerges. Um, in a more structured and formal way category theory gives us a language to to go about that contemplation more 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 formally so just wanted to add that so there's a the conflict that's happening with neurons and cells did i hear that i mean we're talking about uh, the cellular level it's not always collaboration right there's conflict right okay so what's interesting is a lot of folks will push back and say we don't want to listen to your podcast because it's about conflict i'm like conflicts mm -hmm. all around us uh, it's it's actually mm -hmm. internal to us too and it's it's not good or bad it just it, well it, there, there is bad conflict don't get me wrong um but it, it's happening all the time uh and, and at the end of the day it's it's got to be collaboration which is i think what you're really talking about with category theory is how do you bring these uh disparate systems or data sources together to uh collaborate uh more effectively i guess um, so yeah, it's it's, yeah. it's kind of funny. Uh, I I can't remember if it's if it was when we sat together in uh, in Texas a few months ago, or if it was on a phone call. But it had to do with explaining something like category theory to an adult, maybe uh, somebody who has an MBA, somebody who's an executive, and they generally like to say things. Can you can you explain this to me like I'm a fifth grader? Uh, mm -hmm. and I, do you remember that, that conversation? I can't remember. Yeah. Okay. I remember. Can you, yeah. Can you, can you tell me your, or share with the audience what your response was to that, that conversation? Well, I think we, we hear that all the time. And actually in the book, we talk about, you know, explain it like I'm five. If you can't explain it to a five-year-old, then you don't understand it. And in the book, we, we tell the story. I mean, we're both parents of, uh, you know, five and six-year-old children. And so the way we describe advanced concepts to them isn't the same way I would describe it to someone who 
um, you know, sort of has more experience and more training and, and so on. And so we just, we, we question why we hear that from managers. Like, why do you want to hear it as a five-year-old? Because you're reducing all the complexity, you're reducing the, everything that's going on and masking a sort of understanding and, and the ability to, to relate better to what we're trying to achieve. So yeah, that's a big barrier is, um, and the reason we wrote the book, actually, part of the reason why we motivate is because when we tried to express these ideas, we were like challenged to get it down to one slide and you've got 30 minutes, right? To tell this, why, why category theory? Can you give me an example? And it really isn't something you can reduce like that. It took a whole book to, to write, motivate and describe and, and articulate our thoughts there. So it's a, it's a challenge we, we faced and hopefully the book can help there. But Esteban, did you want to add anything? Yeah, I think what I, what I will add is this concept of the, the unsayable. So there's another big debate in philosophy is this, this idea that are there things that are unsayable, unthinkable? Like meaning, does our cognitive capability have limitations in where it can actually conceive? And, and so if you believe that the answer is no, then everything can be theoretically expressed in a computer because it's just a matter of understanding it and then putting it in a, in a computer, right? So that's mm -hmm. kind of uh, some of the premises and some of the, some of the believers of that. Like, if you believe, like, like me, that there are such a things in life that are unsayable, meaning not unsayable because they are horrible, unsayable because they are beyond our capacity, um, there are things that can only be expressed through experiences. You, th there are some mm -hmm. things that you can just not describe with words. And so if you, if you believe that, um, mm -hmm. then it is not about allowing you to access. It is about trusting. So in my relationship with a five-year-old, I don't have to explain a lot of the things. There is, a, there is such a thing called trust. Mm -hmm. There is such a thing about the relationship that relies in something that transcends words. And, I, and, if you, and, and, and that doesn't happen only with kids. It happens with couples. It happens with parents it happens with people who are not even alive like there are some relationships that transcend mm -hmm. their capacity to to be expressed and so that's kind of uh, and let, let me be a little bit critic here of the current trend right of philosophy and and artificial intelligence artificial intelligence relies a lot in linguistics today think mm -hmm. about the, the, the even the word large mm -hmm. language models yep. yes language is the key but that stands over the assumption that we can access things through language which I don't believe. I believe that a lot of life, a lot of the important things about life, if you have been in combat, if you have been in, in real decision-making rooms, a lot is beyond words. It's about mm -hmm. tension. It's about emotions. It's about meaning. It's about our life being in danger or not. And, um, and, I, think, and I think it's a disservice to our humanity and to ourselves to pretend that that, does, that, that is not true. Uh, and what about if we could develop science that transcends words? So when Brandon talks about structures, yeah. Yeah. what is fascinating is that those structures cannot be explained. They, 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 be, they, they behave in ways that make sense, but they, they don't necessarily have to be explainable in words. And so this is a, a, a barrier to access category theory and to access many of the things that we are doing. It's like people want to understand. We think that we can. Um, so I don't know if, if that makes sense to what you were asking, but it, 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 it yeah. brings about to me, the challenge of linguistics has limits with Wittgenstein, um, yeah. you know, the limits of my world are, are the limits of my work, of my, yeah. of my, of what I can say. And, um, and if you believe that that is the case, then you open yourself with humility to experiential, um, bio, chemical, physical relationships to the world in where we live. There's a, uh, a phrase that uh, Dave Snowden shares quite a bit, and it's, I mean, hopefully I get this right. We know more than we can say, and we can say more than we can write down, right? Uh, mm -hmm. So this, this, this is that. And that context you're bringing up there, it is, uh, you know, that context. Uh, so in John Boyd Zuda Loop, we have an orientation, previous experience, and, and maybe we can, that, that includes the context. I have previous experience doing this, which means I have a context that's like this, which you may not be able to relate to, right? And I think that's a... Uh, um, a lot of what you were just pointing out there and that's limited by language. Am I, is that right? Yes. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. I mean, think about this paradox uh, and this puzzled me. So it doesn't, I know, I don't know if it will make sense. It, it, it took me a while to sing this, but 
you cannot even describe what a word means sometimes. Right. In different like languages. You, yeah. you yeah. So, but language is limited in its own sense. Um, and when you embrace that, I think you open yourself to a new type of math, a new yeah. type of science, a new type of reasoning. Um, that's, I think, a naive way of thinking about category theory, by the way. I think yeah. a naive way of thinking about category theory is to think about it as a language to express the unsayable. I think, okay. I think it's, an, I think it's not, I think it's not that because I think if it's unsayable, it's unsayable. It's like, you can't, you can't express it. What I think it could do is to access it through an experiential mm -hmm. um, way. I think you, I think access it is different than, than, than expressing it in a, in a way mm -hmm. that is traceable. So I don't know, but we can debate about that. I mean, that's a, that's a controversial position there, but yeah. Just to just to throw it there. Uh, the uh, you going back to language. Uh, it, so in American English, uh, we talk about um, accountability and responsibility, and we go back and forth with the definition, and people mix it up. And you know, it's and, and you go to you know, I think in Spanish and Portuguese, I can't remember which mm -hmm. one. There's no word for accountability. I believe. Uh, I believe. Right. Right. Spanish. So okay. So, so now, mm -hmm. not only we're confused here in the U.S. about what accountability means, we have 20 different definitions of it. Go overseas and talk about accountability as a keynote speaker, and you're going to lose everybody. <laughs> right. Yeah. Okay. No, that's fascinating. Yeah. All right, guys. Hey, this has been awesome. Uh, I want to do this again, uh, maybe six months, nine months down the road after you guys um, do, do your stuff. And, and are, are you both speaking at the conference, or how's that working out? What's, what's the – okay. Different yeah, conferences. I'll be I'll oh, be different. calling in remote. <laughs> yeah, Esteban's going okay. to Spain uh, for he'll he'll be there in person. I'm presenting uh, remotely, and then I'm going to DC uh, August first week of August to present at the Applied Category Theory Conference. Esteban will call in remotely for that. So we're we're sort of okay each each side of the the world on that one. Yeah, so things are picking up with uh, hold on then, right? I mean, it sounds like um, mm -hmm. all right. Yeah, I've been following uh, some of the the things on there. It's it's are you guys pretty excited about that? Incredibly exciting. Yeah. I mean, we are meeting people like you. I mean, we are having these conversations in multiple different venues, and yeah, that is that is exciting in itself. I and mean, what is happening today, right now, is, is incredibly exciting for us. So thank you, thank you, Pond, for making yeah, this happen. Yeah, you're, you're you're right. It's the network. It's the relationships, right? And and what, what's happening through? I, I imagine what you're doing through Hold On and what we're doing are very similar. Uh, our conversations go from neurotechnology to. Uh, human performance, uh, human and organizational performance, you know, things like safety to agility, uh, neuroscience to AI. It's just amazing. You, you know, we're, our heads are spinning that we could actually somewhat hang with these, these, I'm not going to call them experts, the leading folks in their field. Uh, they are experts. Don't, don't get me wrong. We just, we just don't like calling each other experts by any means. So I can, <laughs> I, I know what you're going through. It's, it's a, uh, it's a whirlwind. And I think all of us are, benefiting from the network um, effect of, of one podcast, the relationships that we have, our net, you know, how we all got connected. Uh, and that's, that, that's what makes uh, one podcasting so much fun. And then uh, it also makes it a little tiring on weekends to, to read so much. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, maybe to, to reflect on that, something that I, I was thinking about this, this conversation this morning, actually, mm -hmm. And we, we have been talking this, this week with Brandon, the concept of good for nothing. Um, you know, I don't know if you have experienced this, but every time you tell somebody, hey, I'm doing a podcast, people say, oh, so for what? What, are you, what do you want to get from it? What do you, you know? Mm -hmm. But what about if the answer was nothing? It's, it's, just, it's just to do this. It's to experience, again, this moment that we are having right now, this exchange, this, yeah. this conversation. I am learning from you. Yeah. Um, uh, I, am, I am enjoying you. I mean, it's, it's, that's enough. They're ha they're, 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 we don't need to have a purpose out of, right. out of these connections. Right. So, so I agree with you 100%. Here's why. The, 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 when we have these conversations, you learn more from having this dialogue than sitting around reading, right? Uh, there's so many things that go. And, and when you get on stage and when you go do a, a conference and you do, do a, you know, a presentation, you're up there to learn just as much as you are to get ideas from, from other uh, um, uh, speakers, right? Because uh, getting on stage, it forces you to think, interact, uh, feel the, you know, the, get the feedback from folks and see what what's resonating with them, 
uh, understanding the context that they're in so you can change up how you deliver things. And by the way, when we deliver workshops, it's the same thing. There's no, there's no, here, here are 10 learning objectives. We're going to go step by step by step and we're going to get done in the next two hours and nobody's going to pay attention. It's we're going to interact with you and we're going to find out what you need to know. And we're going to take the tools out of our toolkit or toolbox and apply them to you right now. So you, you get some type of experience out of it and you can learn. So you're spot on. Uh, I would say that uh, uh, one of the great things about doing uh, these things now, the podcast is the transcripts, right? You get all the context from and you can start to use uh, LLMs to co start connecting them, right? And figure out wh what am I missing? What mm -hmm. am I uh, mm -hmm. seeing uh, and building content up? Yeah. So yeah, there, there, there's, there are some purposes well, behind it. What's that? We'll get you using the category theory to make sure you're, you're putting your ideas together. Uh, I, that'd be awesome. I, I tell you, in, in the last six months, you know, this has really been a real possibility uh, to bring the, together these different ideas. And and what's what's happening with the podcast is is becoming an attractor for folks. People are coming to it and saying, "Hey, look at the quality of people you're bringing on there and the conversations you're having." Um, it's not about AI every every time, right? It's not about mm -hmm. um, leadership every day, right? It's it's based on some features of the world that we just can't get rid of, right? We have to embrace them and um, reorient ourselves so we can go through that cycle of destruction and creation. So awesome, guys. I love it. Hey, any questions to me before I... Actually, I'm going to go ahead and sign off here and then uh, I'll, I'll stop a recording unless you have anything else you want to add before we start recording. Nope. Thanks right. again, Just Fon. to say thank you one more time. Awesome.